Well, my husband is generally considered to be the landscape artist of the family. I have really enjoyed diving into landscapes more lately. Um, it's been something that I've been doing more as a color study and just kind of an oddly satisfying, very soothing painting practice. They're also really trendy right now, so having a couple more landscapes around the house to hang up hasn't hurt me at all. <laughs> In this video tutorial, I'm going to share with you just a couple tips and tricks for creating a very minimal, very soothing, a little bit moody landscape that you can hang up around your house or you can just enjoy the color process. I am using a very limited color palette for this piece. I'll be sharing with you kind of some of the color mixing, the color theory that goes into this watercolor landscape tutorial, but it is very beginner friendly. There's not a lot of advanced techniques. I will be diving into some of the techniques I use specifically for clouds in more detail in a later video because I do think that usually it's helpful. <laughs> Clouds are a little bit tricky, but I think that you'll find that this video is not only kind of oddly satisfying in the creation process, it's very easy to do, it's very beginner friendly, um, but it's just a lot of fun and I think it'll be something that you'll be proud to hang up in your home. Now you can already see that I have prepared my canvas with some painter's tape. So that is just taped around the sides, not only to divide this larger piece of paper in half, but also to tape it down to my desk in order to prevent any distortion. Now for the horizon line, I don't want it to be in this very center of the page. I either want it to be a little bit above or a little bit below. So I'm actually gonna go significantly below because I just find that having it um, away from the center, you don't have to be quite as exact, even though that has its own fun look. In general, it is recommended to kind of avoid that very center for your horizon line. And if you don't know what I mean by horizon line, basically it is the line, the invisible line where the sky comes down and meets the ground. And so that horizon line, think of it when you're looking at a sunset over the water, um, where kind of the sun kind of goes in half and you can see the water and the reflection of the sun, um, that line in between, that very defined line would be your horizon line. So here I want it to be on the lower half this time because I do wanna have some fun clouds involved. Um, and I'm just kind of trying to keep it significantly on the lower half so that it's not confusing. It just makes a much more pleasing composition than having the horizon line in the center. So you can see I had kind of a very loose sketched out hill there that I'm using my eraser on. I initially put it right in the middle of the page and I want to avoid that. So either put things um, slightly above or slightly below depending on your composition. All right, zooming in here, you can see a little bit of what I've sketched out. This is very, very, very light because I want to be very loose and a little bit more fluid. I have a spot marked off for some trees. I already have my horizon line. I'm just doing kind of some squiggly lines of where there will be some foliage. This is gonna be a very loose piece. Again, I'm really focusing on the color study, the color relationships and some of the personality there. I will have a hill kind of in the background of this plane. And so I did have that sketched out as well. Now, in order to avoid everything getting too dark or seeing pencil lines in my final painting, I am going over everything quickly with an eraser. I can still see the lines. You probably are gonna have trouble seeing them if I'm completely honest, but that's why we talked through everything and you can kind of see where I'm going with this piece. All right, now it's time to start adding some paint. I'm going to be using my quill brush. This is a number six quill brush. It is a gigantic thirsty brush and I'm going to just start by wetting my canvas. So I'm going to start on the sky. Most artists will work sky down when they're working with a watercolor landscape. Um, so they'll do the sky and then we'll do the next area in the very background um, and then work from there towards the viewer. And so that is what I'm going to be using today. I'm using a very, very minimal palette of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, and sap green. Unfortunately, in this video, I got into saying raw sienna, but it's definitely burnt sienna the entire video. And you can see kind of above this piece that I already created one painting. And if you'd like to see that one, it was a little bit more experimental, so that it was a little bit more rough. <laughs> so it didn't think it was as good for a beginner tutorial, but if you'd like to see it, just let me know in the comment section down below and I'll try to make it happen, maybe work up some courage. And all I'm doing here is I am applying 
a light wash of color. So I'm moving my brush back and forth very quickly. I'm just trying to fill in all that space that will be the sky eventually. So it is mostly ultramarine, but I have quite a bit of that raw sienna in there and that will just desaturate it, take that cooler blue and warm it up a little bit and just give it a little bit more personality. I am being much darker at the very top of my canvas and allowing the water to the paint to lighten up a little bit on the way down. Um, that's just kind of some atmospheric perspective. It's something that you'll naturally see if you are studying the sky. Now I'm taking a little bit of bath tissue here and I did, did you see that I dabbed it first in my paint? I don't want it to be a perfectly dry um, piece of wad of paper when I start applying it to my canvas. Um, I'm just kind of using it to dab some clouds, but I want there to be some excess paint left over. Now I will have a full tutorial where I talk a little bit more about how to add the clouds in here coming up later, but you can kind of watch my technique here. This is probably my favorite technique. There are techniques where you just leave spaces blank, but I really like having those big fluffy clouds. And so I want to kind of be picking up and removing those clouds. Next, I'm going to take my size 10 brush and I'm just going to soften the edges a little bit and that will help it to look a little bit more realistic um, and just a little bit fluffier and a little less like I took a tissue to it. <laughs> Once my edges were softened the way I wanted them to be, I just took some of the paint that I already had mixed and I added it to the bottom, so the lower side of the clouds, and I made shadows. I'm going in with these shadows very, very lightly, so there's not a lot of pigment on my brush. Occasionally I go in and I add a couple of different colors in there just for some reflected color, some reflected light, um, and to add a little bit of personality to them, um, but that's not required. And I recommend not starting off that way if you're just kind of figuring out clouds. It can be easy to kind of overwhelm your sky or to accidentally mix those reflected colors in with your sky and make it look like you have an alien invasion coming or something like that. So work on this slowly, kind of build up to it. Don't be afraid to go back in with that tissue. Continue to blot some things out if you accidentally got rid of details that you wanted to keep. Um, but just kind of experiment with this a little bit before you um, get a little too crazy or a little too bold with your colors. Now I'm gonna take our sky color again. I'm just gonna run that along just the very top of this hill that I'm going to have in the background. And part of that is because I wanna make sure that it blends nicely in. I wanna have some nice soft lines. Because it will be in the background, I don't want to have those harsh lines in between the hills. I want it to look very soft and very kind of ethereal. Um, and so in order to do that, I'm kind of just adding in some of the blue. Now it's time to go in heavy handed with our green. We're going to be mixing our base color for the hill and then eventually the plain. So I'm taking all three of my colors. I have my sap green. I'm taking a lot of that raw sienna. You can see that mixing in there. That will desaturate it and give it kind of an olive green color. But I'm adding the blue in there again just to kind of deepen it. By having all those colors together, um, I can get a really nice, rich, dark color. Um, so I'm including all three of them. Um, one color is included to kind of help desaturate, bring some warmth in, and then the blue is included to kind of desaturate or to deepen the overall hue a little bit. And then I'm just going to apply this very liberally. So there is a lot of water on my brush. It's not soaking wet, so I'm not like leaving little puddles, but it is definitely moving across that canvas. Um, there's definitely, see there's a lot of water now moving around quite a bit, um, but I'm just kind of working one section at a time, trying to really get it mixed in so that it's a nice, even application. I'm kind of establishing where the hills and where the planes are going to be on this horizon line. Um, and then I'm just applying more color. <laughs> so getting everything nice and wet and getting a really good establishment down. Now I'm adding a lot more of that raw sienna because I like to include those warm colors in here, especially as we're moving towards the horizon line. So you'll notice that I include a lot more of that raw sienna in the plain area, which will be kind of coming towards the viewer rather than on the hill. I'm switching back to my size 10 round brush. 
and it's wet, I'm just going to run that along this line. It was a little too sharp. You might remember that I mentioned just a minute ago, if you're an excellent student, an excellent listener, that I want the edge of this hill to be nice and soft, just to show it's in the background. So this is a clean brush, meaning that there's no pigment on it, but there is some water, not a lot. It's very, it's just damp. And I'm just running that along and that will help to pick up and disperse a little bit and just soften that edge. And you'll see that it will soften very nicely. It'll have a nice little haze to it. Now I'm going back in with the raw sienna, which is the direction I was going in before I noticed that it wasn't ending. It wasn't quite going the direction I wanted it to go. And I'm defining some of the space in between these two sections. So I have the hill, but I also want to show where the horizon line for this plane, where those two intersect and kind of define that space. Adding a little bit more blue into this section. Um, so I'm just kind of taking the color that we're already mixing, adding a little bit more blue, and that will again help to make things nice and cool. And the cooler colors will be pushed back. The raw sienna, the warmer tones will come towards the viewer. So what you'll notice that I'm doing quite a bit is I'm pretty much just mixing a different ratio of all three colors while I'll be working on this um, land section. <laughs> I'm not really sure what else to call it, um, but I think that you'll know what I mean. Um, and sometimes it'll be a little heavier on the blue. Sometimes it'll be almost all raw sienna. And other times it'll be very green. Um, but these different ratios will give it a cohesive look without allowing it to become boring because there will be a lot of color variation, a lot of interesting difference, um, a lot of interesting differentiation within the landscape as a whole. And that's what I was talking about when I was saying that these are color studies. It's a lot of color theory is that I'm really leaning in on the different personalities of each color. And so using what I know about color theory, using their relationship with each other to play and explore in different ways. So now I'm moving on to the foreground. I really like where the clouds are going. There's some nice blue differentiation in there. And then we have our rust tones as well. So I want to deepen everything. Now, darker shapes will come towards the viewer visually. So if you're trying to make a series of different hills or mountains and you want to, or you're struggling to have, you know, some elements come forward and they just look like they're all in the same place, anything that is lighter will fall away from the viewer. So it goes back in the distance and anything that is darker will come towards the viewer. Um, same is true with warmer and cooler colors. So cooler tones, I think I already said this, but just in case cooler tones can fall backwards, just like a lighter tone will and a warmer tone, just like a darker tone will come towards the viewer. Now, again, here I'm just having some fun. I'm kind of allowing some natural rows and some visual interest to happen. So I want the eye of the viewer to be led forward as though it's a long plane. Maybe it's freshly mowed. Maybe it's, you know, there's things growing in a row. And so I'm playing around with this um, contrast of the warmer tones, the warmer green that I've mixed, and the cooler green. And so I'm kind of creating some natural rows in there. I'm also starting to define where my foliage will be later on by just kind of tapping in some of this darker color. We'll be establishing that quite a bit more soon. Now, if you have seen any of my landscapes in the past, you'll know that I like to have a little bit of a darker tone in my corners. And so I'm applying a mix that's a little bit more the ultramarine to the edges. And I'll be adding even more in a little bit. Next, I'm taking just some regular table salt over the areas that are wet, so in the foreground, and applying that to the piece as a whole. And we will kind of wipe those the excess off later. This will create a fun visual texture and just give a little bit of interest to the overall composition. Another trick to establishing that hierarchy or that depth is that elements that are closer to the viewer are going to have more detail. So they're going to be darker, they're probably going to be a warmer tone, and they're going to have a lot more detail. So by including the salt, by tapping in some of these deeper colors in amongst those little grains of salt, 
I am establishing a little bit more detail and showing that, okay, this area is in the foreground. It is closest to the viewer. Not only is it kind of, if we're using our imagination, close to our feet, but it is also, there's just a lot more detail. So it must be fairly close in proximity to the eyes of our viewer. Now the dark blue that I'm tapping in here, I'm looking at the finished piece while I am kind of examining this. I don't know if I would necessarily do that again. I enjoyed it. It has kind of a nice effect, um, but I think I'd want to be more strategic, like including it as a wildflower or something a little bit more intentional. Um, it doesn't necessarily look bad, but I don't think I would include it again. Um, for this piece. So if you are copying me right now, you feel free to leave out the dark blue spots or just do less than I did. Um, I don't think that it really helped a whole lot with the composition. Um, I don't think it necessarily hurt, but it's one of those things that eh, I probably wouldn't do it again. So here is that piece completely dried. It's showing up a little bit desaturated on the screen, but you can see I am just kind of rubbing off some of the salt. So you can see how the blue kind of collected where the salt was, but the salt still had its effect. It was kind of an interesting experiment. Again, I don't know if I would necessarily do it again. Um, I'm just rubbing off the excess salt. I probably went away as long as I did. I was interrupted by the end of nap time personally. And so um, all of the salt is very, very stuck on my painting, um, which I usually, I usually don't do, but it happens and it is what happened for me. <laughs> so I'm just kind of rubbing it off. I tried a little bit with the paper towel or the bath tissue. Um, didn't found that, didn't find that to be super successful. Um, so maybe not, don't worry about doing that. But when your piece dries, you can kind of wipe off the salt. Now that I'm done kind of messing with the salt, I've, I've uh, collected a lot of the paint that we've been working with. So the same three colors, this time we're pretty heavy on the green. There is still a lot of that raw sienna in there so that we get some desaturation and the ultramarine to bring down the overall value. Um, and I'm just going to kind of wiggle my brush around and just kind of pat on the now dry canvas overall. Everything is dried. Um, you'll remember I said that this was the next day. So everything is bone dry. And I'm just tapping things in and trying to kind of have a plan, a little bit of a plan for the foliage. So I'm kind of trying to include a tree in here. I'm including some areas that are a little bit more blue. So I'll have a section I'm trying to move in a rhythm. So I'm not just kind of tapping blue, the blue sections in at random. I'm trying to have a plan. So it might be more of the shadow of the space overall, or, you know, like I might have a little bit of the raw sienna in a section that, you know, it's kind of implies that this branch has died or some of the branch has died. And so there's some of this raw sienna and just kind of going branch by branch, trying to have a plan to think, okay, where would the light source be coming from? Where would the shadow then be because of the light source? Um, and kind of the rule of thumb is to just choose a side. So I have that blue section, but it's on the lower left-hand side, and I'm going to keep it on the lower left-hand side. And then anything that I create in addition to this piece will follow the same rule. So it'll be lower left-hand side for that bluer section. So now I'm adding in a little bit of that raw sienna just to kind of add, again, some personality. You'll see I'm not just splattering it around. It's very planned, very calculated in. If I'm going in with one dot, I'm going in with probably three or four and kind of moving it all around in a cluster. Um, that will help it to look a little bit more intentional and a little bit less like Dalmatian spots. Now, as I continue to add some more foliage in around this first tree, I kind of wanted to still have some differentiating elements between the two. If I had planned it a little bit better, I probably would have gone lighter on the surrounding elements and allowed the tree to be the very darkest. But I didn't do that, and so you can learn from my mistakes. Make your tree a little bit darker than everything else. I'm also not including quite as much of the color variation, especially as I'm getting farther away. So I wanna show that it's farther away, it's going kind of along the plane as it's going towards the right hand side. And so I'm not only making things a little bit smaller, I'm allowing it to get a little bit lighter. I have less detail, less differentiation, um, less capturing little leaves and more just larger blobs. 
I am including a little bit of that cooler blue tone in there and of it all at the bottom. So if there's a spot that it goes up, it goes up on the left. So I'm kind of staying consistent with what I had going on with the tree, but really just trying to keep everything um, cohesive and consistent. Now I'm taking that green shade again and I'm adding it as a light wash, really more of a glaze to the plane as a whole. I like the effect that the salt gave, but it was a little bit too much. So in order to soften it, I'm adding a green glaze to the entire piece. Not enough water to reactivate the paint that is already dried, but enough to move the glaze along. So that's kind of a tricky uh, balance to get. Air on the side of less water, it's easier to add a little bit of water um, or to go back in with a little bit more. It's a lot harder to deactivate paint that has already been reactivated. Some of what I'm doing is kind of reapplying some of the color differentiation that we already had. So we already had kind of these little stripes with the rust and the ultramarine, um, the rust being the raw sienna, uh, but the rust color and the ultramarine blue with the sap green. I'm kind of adding those in again, but a little bit softer. Again, I'm just trying to soften some of the contrast that happened with the salt. I kind of liked where it was going, but I also felt like it was too much with what I had going on with the piece as a whole. I don't want to distract from my clouds, really like my clouds. Don't want to distract from the greenery that I have. I like where that's going. And so in order to soften that a little bit, applying that glaze very softly, very quickly to the entire plane help to just kind of quiet everything down. Now I'm going over the greenery again with my very darkest values. And I'm just building up some of that color, building up some of those shadows with the same dark green color that we had before. I might still you know, bring in some of the blue or some of the rust, but I'm really focusing on getting some nice rich values in there. So it's giving it a little bit more of a focal point, a little bit more emphasis. And that's what I was going for. I, I just felt like there was, it was all to the same with value. And so by darkening it um, with some more of this pigment, um, it helped to kind of create some differentiation. Now I took a very dark, almost black color, and I'm very lightly adding in just some twigs, some stems, some branches in here. Um, I don't want it to be a huge focal point. I don't want it to be something that people notice right away, but I do want to have a hint of it. So I'm applying it while the paint is still a little bit wet in order to kind of um, allow it to blend back in a little bit, but I still wanted to have that differentiation. These are the final details that really make a painting. So I'm adding some height variation. I didn't really love how it was just like this lone tree and this weird row of shrubs. So I'm including another one. It's a little bit lighter than the one that's closer to the viewer and it's a little bit smaller, um, but just continuing to add them, trying to make it a little random um, and a little bit more natural. And that is where I decided to call it done. I really love how the raw sienna, the rusty tone, causes your eye to move around the page. I love the gentle texture that the salt created, and I really, really like those clouds. I can't wait to experiment with those more. But I think my very favorite part is taking off this tape. Those nice crisp lines. Oh, it's so satisfying. And it's also kind of nice to get that bright blue out of the way. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed that tutorial as much as I enjoyed creating it and that you feel empowered to create your own landscape. If you enjoyed this video and have not done so already, please give it a thumbs up. That really helps me out as an educator and it also helps me to know what you'd like to see in the future. Um, I just got some gouache, so I'm kind of excited to start playing with adding gouache into the landscape painting process. And if you'd be interested in seeing something like that, gouache is basically just opaque watercolor. So we'd be able to do a couple of things that we can't do with just watercolor as easily. And if you'd be interested in seeing something like that, let me know in the comment section down below. I think we'll be able to get more of an oil um, paint kind of feel and kind of vibe and I'm excited about that. I can just do it for myself but if you'd like to see it I'd love to know down below and until next time happy painting! <laughs>